We're now into the second day of mourning here in the Netherlands for Peter de Vries, the investigative crime journalist. We are appalled died by the apparently earth. arbitrary killing of nine activists in simultaneous... Tonight, more meetings. bloodshed in Mexico. Another journalist killed this week in the country. Five he was known for fighting for the little guys, for trying to dig out corruption. From the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, this is the Ripple Effect. This is the Ripple Effect, and I'm your host, Ana Paula Oliveira. Throughout this series, we've looked at assassination of key vulnerable groups in civil society, from journalists to human rights defenders to those in position of political power. But how do authorities go about investigating contract killings? How can they go beyond the initial crime scene to find the mastermind behind the attack? Hopes of a rescue lost with the murder investigation underway. Brazilian authorities have recovered the bodies of British journalist Dom Phillips and his expert guide. One of the Pereira. biggest challenges when investigating assassinations is identifying that this is a work of organized crime, that a murder for hire has indeed taken place. So what is the best approach? Steve Camordi is the director of programs of the Wildlife Justice Commission. He has over 30 years of law enforcement experience, having served with the New South Wales Police Force. Mr. Carmordi was also a senior law enforcement expert with the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crimes. Often they are quite obvious. You know, you have a body murdered in, in a very public place or a very violent manner, but often you don't have a body. Uh, there may be a person that's been kidnapped or someone that just disappears. So, from a law enforcement perspective, from an investigative perspective, you need to identify very quickly what you're dealing with so that you can bring together the right resources, the right units, start investigating as quickly as you can. The more time between identifying that there has been a crime and identifying the location of crime scenes, the greater chance you have of, of losing evidence. So moving very quickly is very important. Bringing together the right people and the right units is also crucial. So setting up a task force that looks at the murder or the, the organised crime hit, bringing different agencies together with different powers and access to different systems. So you have a full range of law enforcement agencies or, or units working together to solve this crime. In an ideal world, all investigations will be conducted by well-trained law enforcement that logically and methodically collect evidence. But often, one of the key issues hindering an investigation is a failure to recognize that a person's occupation could be a motivating factor in their murder. Making this linkage helps to widen the lens and identify suspects. What did the victim stand for? Who would benefit from their murder? Asking these questions helps lift the lead on the chain of command. But as explained by Agnes Kalamat, Secretary General of Amnesty International and former UN Special Rapporteur in extrajudicial killings, there are systemic problems to overcome. The hitman may be investigated and indeed may be identified, but for the investigators, the police, to be able to then walk up the chain of command in order to reach those people at the top who ordered the killing, that is far more difficult. And this is particularly so when those at the top of the chain of command are politicians, are members of the governments with some connection in the organized crime community. There are also systemic problems that one may confront when investigating the assassination of individuals who are targeted because of their public position or because they've denounced organized crimes or they denounce corruption. Some of the problems that I have most often encountered in investigating investigations is, for instance, the fact that the families of the victims are unable to register the attack because the police is unwilling to let them do so, maybe out of fear, maybe because they are corrupt. We also see systemic failures in the absence of scientific investigation, in the lack of forensic skills, or indeed in eyewitnesses not being interviewed. 
I personally have looked at investigation of journalists, for instance, who were reporting on corruption and who had been killed for that purpose. And five years after their killings, the eyewitnesses still had not been interviewed by the police. And another problem that one confronts very often in this kind of situation is the unwillingness of the police to consider the identity or the work of the victim as motivations for their targeting. They may go for other hypotheses, for instance, that the victims has been the object of a, of a crime, you know, like people attempt to steal their car, but very rarely will they be prepared to consider that the person has been targeted because of what they were reporting, what they were denouncing, uh, what they were working on. Another really important thing to do is, is to ensure that you have sufficient funding available. Steve outlines further factors that require consideration when it comes to investigations into these crimes. Because they are expensive. You know, we're not just talking about crime scene costs or the cost for expert witnesses. We're talking about surveillance. We're talking undercover. We're talking telephone interception and listening devices. These things are very costly investigations, time intensive and labor intensive. And also to develop your investigative strategies. You know, are you going to attack the network? Have you identified the network? Are you going to look for a cooperator? Is there someone sitting in prison that's prepared to talk to you? With organized crime hits, people talk. People know. People know why this person was murdered. It's just a matter of getting them to talk to law enforcement and to go to paper and go to court. Another thing is to follow the money. See who are the corrupt politicians or lawyers or judges or police that are looking after these guys and start working them. I was arrested, I was told, because of an article I published about the leader of the opposition. I have no evidence. We have explored many cases so far, from journalist Daphne Caruana Galizia to the environmentalist and indigenous leader Berta Cáceres. We, of course, gather because we condemn the brutality of her killing. We gather to stand. With most contract healings, there are significant delays and issues, not only identifying the intellectual authors, but prosecuting and adjudicating cases against them. What are the differences between prosecuting a perpetrator and a person who ordered the assassination? It's a lot harder to convict the mastermind than it is to convict the perpetrator. With the perpetrator, there's usually physical evidence of some sort, whether it's DNA, ballistics, fibers, fingerprints, that link them to the crime scene, that link them to the act that's resulted in the murder. There's witnesses that have seen the murder. There's CCTV. You know, you have things that are tangible that, that a jury can understand and you can show them. With the mastermind, it's a lot harder. One, the perpetrator may not even know who the person was that ordered the crime. So it's very difficult for them to give testimony against the person that's, that's paid them, basically. The mastermind is at least one, but generally multiple steps away from the contract killer. There's a lack of physical evidence linking them to the crime scene. So basically what it comes down to is motive. Why would this person benefit from the murder of the victim? And you've got to be able to prove that and prove that in a court of law beyond a reasonable doubt. You know, unless you have conversation, unless you have cooperating witnesses, that's going to be very difficult to do. In the modern era, we also have much stronger and secure communications. So criminals are communicating and law enforcement is not in a position to intercept those messages. Sometimes those messages are not accessed for years later. But at the time, it's very difficult to get into these systems that are used by these criminal networks. And your mastermind has access to resources. He has money, he has access to lawyers, accountants, and access to powerful people. People that the perpetrator may not have access to. You know, it's in the interest of the mastermind that the perpetrator is the only person that's convicted for this crime. So what needs to change in order to help an investigation to be successful? In the case of Daphne Caruana Galizia, unprecedented international pressure led to the recognition of the corrupt environment that led to her killing. It also helped bring a case against those who allegedly masterminded her murder. In the case of that particular killing, Agnes explained how regional and international institutions can use their technical mandates to create what she calls circumstantial evidence, helping the prosecution's case. It included the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, who appointed a Council of Europe special rapporteur to assess uh, the rule of law and how it impacted on the investigation into the killing. A third 
intergovernmental institution was the Venice Commission, which is a European Commission for Democracy Through Law. And it's made up of uh, very high level lawyers mostly. And then there was the fourth regional institution, which is a group of states against corruption that also contributed to the investigation. So all four institutions played a, a very important role. They all investigated what had happened from the standpoint of their own mandate. So they, they were not responsible for doing what the Maltese police was responsible for doing, but they could do something else. In the case of the special rapporteur, he assessed the rule of law from the standpoint of international standards, and he concluded with evidence that the rule of law in Malta failed to meet European standards. The Venice Commission looked at the separation of power in Malta and concluded that there too, Malta democratic system failed to meet the basic standard of separation of power. The uh, Group of State Against Corruption uh, reviewed the measures against corruption and found them to be insufficient. So each of those agencies played their own technical role, contributing to circumstantial evidence, pointing to the systemic failure of the state. And I have no doubt that this made it much easier, quotation mark, for the truth to be uh, revealed, because once the system is being presented in all its uh, limitation, weaknesses and corruption, that's the beginning of the unfolding, really, of the dynamic that made the killing of Daphne possible. But even with this positive advancements, more than five years have passed and there's still no judicial response against the alleged mastermind. The fight against the system of corruption and collusion is only beginning. When investigating assassinations, police, the prosecution and families of the victims are often facing an uphill battle. There is a clear need for authorities to recognize the important role occupation and public activities play in making people a target. The international community has the opportunity to exert political pressure and increase the rate of prosecution of these crimes. Even one successful investigation can serve as a deterrent and reduce repetition. Join us next time for our final episode on contract killings as we look deeper at the role of the international community and reflect on the conditions necessary to prevent assassinations. If you enjoyed the Ripple Effect, please share and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>